go instead of uh, introduction of invariant measures and a new formula Okay, let's see if your peers have come in or oh, uh well maybe a little bit more um okay i i think we can uh start slowly now um so as you have seen we have finished proving the wickham theorem uh, that was a big deal i mean of course i mean uh, for us, after you know, after you know, we spent a lot of time developing the whole framework, then things becoming, you know, like um, easier and easier day by day. But uh, the whole thing was not easy at all, and it was great that we could prove it. And now we're gonna sort of uh, start using the the Wickham theorem that we have the whole. Uh, backward characteristics or um, um, uh, calibrated curves, you know, right? We, we're gonna use sort of like the whole calibrated curves, uh, calibrated curves, you know, gamma going from minus infinity to zero to the torus with gamma zero equals to X. So, you know, you can start with this point X, you have this calibrated curves going from minus infinity to that. If you start at with another point uh, Y, you have another calibrated curves, you know? So if you want, you can name this one gamma X just to make sure that it's depending on X, gamma Y that's depending on Y. And if we sort of keep track of all possible calibrated curves, then we can see so or try to see what's going on, and that's essentially uh, you know our goal of uh, you know using those calibrated curves. We can use those to so use those to create you know invariant measures, and that's you know that's the goal because because you know understanding their behavior um, deeply is hard and sometimes it's easier to relax it and to keep track with certain sort of, uh, you know, like uh, ergodic properties and in this case, invariant measures are suitable, okay? So so that's sort of the, the, the gap. Um, uh, so I recall quickly here what we have proved. So we have proved that there's a, uh, U continuous or Lipschitz uh, that that is satisfied this fixed point uh, result and you know, we have we have an uh, invariant uh, I mean calibrated curves or backward characteristics that if we go along this backward characteristics or calibrated curves if you take any point going from here to here you can see that you know the 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 difference in values is equals to exactly exactly the, uh, the the action functional. So you, you can imagine that going along those backward characteristics are uh, optimal, right? You know, or you can think of that, you know, essentially those are geodesic rays, you know, because, you know, it gives you the minimum cost, okay? So in principle, you can think about those as, uh, you know, geodesic rays or, you know, one-sided uh, minimizers of the race, whatever, um, okay? Um, um, so that's sort of what we're gonna use to, to construct our invariant measures. And one of the property that we already proved is that uh, U minus is differentiable along the, the backward characteristics, right? Uh, so, you know, if you, if you take those points, let's say, X, Y, Z, and all the possible points, you know, you go along the backward characteristic or calibrated curves, 
going along those points, then if you take any points in here, um, so again, my xd here, then you have u minus is differentiable at gamma xd. Again, I added the x here just to say that our ray starting or ending at x for, for any t less than zero. And you can even compute the gradient, right? d minus or du minus of, uh, of, gamma, of gamma xd is nothing but dv of l of gamma xd, gamma x dot of t. Okay, so that's that's really beautiful. Um, but clearly, that at the end point, it might be the case that your your u is not differentiable there. Okay, uh, I think I made a typo here. It should be u on on the left panel, the u minus. Okay, so you see that. Again, we have we have developed a good framework that's saying that you know everything is nice at those uh, as those points along the calibrated curves or geodesic rays or whatever, and we have that um, the function is differentiable there. It might not differentiable at the endpoints, and again by Rademacher theorem, if you have a Lipschitz function, it might not be differentiable at a set of measure zero, right? So it's, it's, it's natural that there are certain points that is not differentiable. Okay, um, so now we're gonna introduce a new notion. This is flow invariance. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's along the way with the fact that I'm gonna introduce invariant measures here. Um, but I'll, I'll just, I'll just uh, write it down right away. Um, so, so flow invariance here is just, you know, so flow invariant flow invariance uh, measures. By this, I mean that they are invariant under the Euler-Lagrange uh, flow. Okay. Um, because, uh, I mean, the, the notion we define here already uh, existed uh, a while ago, right? I mean, um, uh, given a point X and a velocity V, we run the the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation with with that initial condition, right? So we can run the Euler-Lagrange equation, and um, we can define the Euler-Lagrange flow correspondingly to be x t v t, where v t is x dot t. So you know you start with a given um, position and velocity. You run the Euler-Lagrange uh, flow. So you you know um, right. So you given x here and given velocity you run the Euler Lagrange flow to be anywhere so you have x t v t right uh, x t v t so you keep track with 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 the uh, uh, Lagrangian uh, framework right you keep track with uh, position and velocity all the times and if you're given a different point here x bar v bar then you run the Euler Lagrange flow you have you know, x bar t, v bar t. So different, different uh, position and velocity gives you different, uh, different uh, curves uh, on uh, in in uh, you know uh, t n cross r n. Okay. Or you can also imagine it to be r n cross r n, but the position is being z n periodic. Doesn't matter. Okay. So if you do so, then we define uh, that a Radon uh, probability measure mu, uh, that is a probability measures on Tn cross Rn is flow invariance. If you, know, if you take uh, any test function C that is bounded, continuous, you uh, take the integral of C d mu is the same as the integral of C uh, phi T L of X V d mu. You know, it people can say that it's a push forward or whatever. I mean, you can imagine simply that, um, like you start uh, um, originally oops, with those points uh, x v x bar v bar, right? So after some time t, you end up with a new position. So uh, this position x 
Xbati, Vibati, XTVT, and it's invariance under the Euler Lagrange flow, meaning that if you push forward or pull back, whatever, at any time, then the integral of C acting on, on D mu is the same. Okay, so that's, that's invariant measures. Uh, and this is quite convenient for us here because we care about, about what is being carried along the geodesics or along the, the, the flow. And, and that's why the notions of, of invariance is important. Again, I'll give you an example later. Um, and um, so again, we, you know, notion, by notions, we mean that in this way, mu is invariance under the Euler-Lagrange flow, okay? Uh, and what is really beautiful here is that we have a new characterization of the constant C0. Uh, earlier, we said that C0 is um, the smallest possible constant so that we can have, you know, it's dominated, uh, the existence of a function dominated by L plus C, right? And now there's a new formula for C0. Um, this is, uh, in a way, it's kind of a, um, like calculus of variation formula. Yeah, some some questions for me. Yeah, I was just curious about this definition. So it seems that there's also kind of a strong form of the definition where you define it directly in terms of the measure, like the push for, forward uh, of the measure along the flow. Are those two equivalent, or is it necessary that we're using this maybe weaker form? Um. So that's a good point. We are using this weaker form because, um, you know, it's, it's easier to deal with measures. I will explain a little bit why, but you are, you're also asking about the measures, right? Or about, about the stronger form of that or? Yeah, I guess I, my main question is, is this uh, definition in terms of uh, like the dual space of bounding continuous functions equivalent to defining flow invariance directly in terms of the measure itself. Okay, so so that's a good point. So, you know, like, um, um, so in fact, uh, we can also uh, write in a dual form, you know, what you said is, is absolutely correct that if you take a space of, 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 of continuous functions uh, in a compact set, you take the dual space is exactly the, 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 the space of rather measures. And, and there are actually a new formulation about that uh, using the dual space that actually I, I wrote it in my book. Um, so, um, so, I mean, the, 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 the question was on, you know, so if you take, uh, let's say K is compact, right? You take the space of continuous function on K, then the, the dual space, it's gonna be the space of uh, of uh, uh, radon radon measures on 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 K, so space of radon measures on K, and 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 actually yes, so I can say that yes, there is there is such a result, there is a, a new framework on this uh, along this line. Uh, so see, uh, see my book. I, I mean, actually, this is a new framework that that uh, only the pretty group came up with recently, in last five years. And um, I wrote that there's a new representation formula for for this kind of solution by using this dual framework. Uh, what I'm telling you here is is more of the classical sense from the you know Mata or Mane or Fatih's times in the uh, 1990 up to 2000 something that uh, that they didn't use this kind of dual framework. They were just using the fact that, you know, like um, you start with curves, it's hard to understand the dynamics of the curves. So you would try to relax it by using, it's kind of like um, invariant measures uh, by, by keeping track with its ergodic properties. Uh, but 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 that that is a very valid question and it's, it's exactly um, the case here. But but um, I don't think that I will uh, have a chance to give you uh, a um, another theorem on this. So so yes. So I can say that uh, and 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 also that there is uh, um, 
maybe after I check back with the book, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. So there's also, also uh, a version of this, of this theorem using uh, the above duality. So yes, ab absolutely. Um, so very good. I'll, 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 after posting the post lecture notes and after teaching, finish teaching the second class, I will um, try to pinpoint to exactly the points that you can have a look, but absolutely very good. Um, so, um, you know, here, I mean, people were concerned with, with just the flow invariance property. And in fact, this is actually a very, uh, it's a very good point of using the Euler-Lagrange flow, but it's a little bit restricted in the sense that hidden here, you know, being um, invariance under the Euler-Lagrange flow is, is it's a big requirement, right? Because you need to deal with the whole Euler-Lagrange flow. And then, you know, for each of the time you need to require that it's invariant. So it's a quite nonlinear requirement, right? It, it's hidden there, it's, it's, a, it's a big requirement. Like even like, how do we know there's an ex, there exists such an invariant measure that's not even clear, okay? And actually we have to use deep result. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, so you said the duality framework, is that the in soup formula of the uh, CNOP? Uh, no, the, uh, the duality framework is actually the one that, uh, that you, you did research on and the one that uh, the paper of Hitoshi Ishii, Hiroyoshi Mitake and myself, that's using the, the duality framework in, in that aspect. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, the duality of measure is function. Is that the one with function? Is the in soup formula? Uh, so, okay. So, so, so two things here. Of course, you know, IMSU formula is, is 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 a good one, right? But but here, what I meant is that is 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 about you know the flow invariance measures are a bit restrictive, right? Because because you 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 need to require this is the, like a, a nonlinear requirement, and actually later on people did say that the requirement this was due to John Matter. They say that this requirement is too nonlinear and it's too hard to verify. Uh, I see. Uh, but 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 if you do, do just directly the duality, you know, you start with space of continuous function, you just look at the space of Radon measures and consider possible cones, uh, then you have new representation formula. Um, again, um, uh, it is kind of holonomy measures and kind of the invariant measures that, for example, you, you wrote in your most recent paper. So that's the kind of new framework. Uh, I see. So, you know, um, but but it's still hard. I mean, <laughs> one way or the other. But but I I I I I must have said that you know this uh, this was due to uh, this was due to uh, first due to matter. But but there was a, a, a strong uh, sense of people in the community saying that the requirement is is too restrictive. But uh, requirement. is uh, quite restrictive as uh, as invariant invariance under the Euler Lagrange flow is quite a strong requirement. So later on there are people like uh, Mane can uh, Mane uh, that can uh, um, can uh, relax it, and they introduce something called holonomy measures, and so on and so forth. But this is still uh, due to the dynamical system community. Uh, for us, the PD, then you know we can we can actually look at this dual uh, in a in a nice way. Uh, and also, we need to be a bit careful because. Uh, because I said that K has to be compact, right? So if K is not compact, if it's T and cross R N, then I need to put some moment bound conditions and blah blah blah. You know, it's it. We have to be careful, but uh, but nevertheless, that that's a very good point. Um, and thanks to the two questions, I think it, it, the, those are great questions to to 
you know, to see what should we do, well, you know, what should have done and what should we do in the literature. Can, can I ask another question as well? Um, maybe this is kind of leading into the next, the next part, but uh, here we, we define uh, these, um, these flow invariant measures for bounded functions. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, now we apply it to L. So are we assuming that L is bounded or? Yes, so that, that's also good. No, yes. So that, that, that's quite good as well. Uh, so there, there's already hidden points here. There are points that are um, uh, unclear, right? So L is our Lagrangian is not bounded, okay? So L, our Lagrangian surely is not bounded in V, right? in V, as you, you know, that is super linear in V. So the, the, the question is actually very valid as well, because, you know, like how, how do we interpret that then? And, 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 and I want to also clear out the water is that um, first remark that uh, we, will, we will have that uh, you know, the support of our measure constructed is bounded. So it's gonna be in Tn cross B0R for our constructed mountain measures or, or invariant measures. So, I mean, we really need this boundedness of, of, of the support of the measures because if the measures has uh, support at infinity, then we got to be really careful. And, 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 and indeed, L is not bounded, but once we have the constructed measures have bounded, uh, bounded support, then, then we are fine. Uh, does that make sense? I see, thank you. Yeah, so great. Again, I, I love your questions as always. You know, you see, we are touching some, <laughs> some, <laughs> something quite, you know, deep and, and, and uh, interesting here. Um, and actually, what, what all of you said is also uh, true that I have to be careful uh, because when we are touching, uh, flow invariant measures and stuff like that, uh, you know, when I'm, I'm using the Lagrangian, I have to be aware of the fact that the Lagrangian is not bounded, right? Why we are, when we are defining invariant measures, we are defining it for, for, for you know, bounded continuous functions, uh, just, just by the setting like in Evans, Gary P and other kind of books on, on, on invariant measures. Okay, so let's start the proof and then stop me anytime if you have questions. The proof is not too hard. I mean, um, so uh, let's let's just write it down anyway, and then uh, and then we see, right? You you start with uh, again for any points uh, by abuse of notions, we say that x of t is the uh, part along the Euler-Lagrange curves. You know, so. Again, I'm not writing yet here down the, the velocity, but that's what I meant by abuse of notions. You know, it actually depends on position and velocity, right? But uh, um, so what 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 we see here is that you know because u minus is bounded by l plus c naught, we have um, the left hand side in terms of the value is bounded by the action functional on the right hand side. Okay, and then um, you realize that okay, this is uh, this is okay for any starting velocity that I type v, right? And um, and pi here is just a projection. Pi here is a natural projection projecting from t n cross r n to t n. You take x v, you projected it to pi x v to be just x, just the location. So you can start with any any uh, given uh, initial uh, uh, velocity v, right? Um, and and you have the same uh, uh, what? Uh, why did I write it equals to? It's less than equals to. Yeah, I, this is a this there's a mistake here. 
this is less than equals to the action function on the right, right? Okay, so it's just the, the Euler Lagrange flow going from minus one to zero. And now you integrate this with respect to invariant measures that is flow invariant, okay? And, and when you integrate that um, with respect to the invariant measures, you have, you have zero equals to the left-hand side, right? Uh, zero equals to the left-hand side because, because uh, you know, uh, u is invariance under under the uh, sorry u is is a function right and when you compute uh, u minus uh, uh, composed with phi is is a bounded continuous function and because of the invariance property of mu that's equal to zero and the right hand side you have is less than equals to this uh, this integral of the measures right And, and, and uh, what, what you asked earlier is, is absolutely valid here. I'm using also the fact that L is invariant under the, the, um, um, the, the measures invariant. So the integral in DS is the same for all S. Uh, again, uh, clarification, I have to be a bit careful here in the sense that what I need is that, you know, the support of H of the is, this kind of measure is, is, is bounded and and you can see that um, you can see that for each of the chosen uh, point uh, v um, you know if I go along this 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 flow uh, the, the, the the x dot is also bounded so so that's okay but otherwise I need to be a little bit careful here but again uh, a bit hand wavy, but uh, but that's true, right? So I conclude that the left hand side, the integral in Tn cross Rn of L d mu x v is going to be greater than equals to minus c naught, and that that gives us the point that for at any measure mu that is flow invariant, I get the uh, the conclusion. Or another way for you to think about this is that is that you can also use the um, monotone conversion theorem in this case. If, if you say that if L is, is um, not bounded, you can do cut off techniques, you know, cut it up for V large and then you can uh, use the monotone uh, conversion theorem to get this. So I'm not worried about this. Um, in a hand wavy way, that's the, that's the case. Okay, great. Now, what, um, so this part, what I said is, is, is not very hard, right? So, so this is okay. But the next step here, what I need to be really careful is that in the construction, in the construction of, uh, of um, invariant measures under the Euler-Lagrange flow, we would need to make sure that um, that our constructed measure measures have compact support. And without compact support, things are, are really hard. I mean, in, as I said, uh, in a, in a non-up-to-date, um, uh, the Wickham theory for non-compact manifold uh, is still pretty much open. If you have things going to infinity, people don't yet know how to handle that. Most of the times people need to put assumption in which that the measures, the, the invariant measures, or later on we call it matter measures, are, having compact supports, okay? So it's quite hard to deal with things going to infinity. All right, so um, to do this, we're gonna use the calibrated curves and I'll give you one example along this line because there was a good question last time as well. So for any point, you can see that the calibrated curves with the n in points. And uh, again, you know, along the, along the calibrated curves, then we have, uh, you know, everything is optimal. We have equality. Okay, maybe I'm using here. Sometimes I'm using T is positive. Sometimes I'm using T is negative. 
So T here for T being negative, you go all the ways from here to here, everything is optimal. Okay. And the way that we're gonna uh, now deal with that is that we're gonna introduce a measure that's that essentially gonna see, uh, you know, like um, essentially it's gonna see uh, the the behavior along the average behavior along this this curve. Okay, and as you asked last time, the measure mu t we define gonna have support exactly on this curve, you know, the support of the measure uh, in location. I mean, the measure is defined in location and velocity. Um, so we define the measure. This is just the inner product, or I mean the, whatever, the, the wedge in, uh, in uh, product of the two, uh, two objects in the dual spaces. Um, so C uh, d mu t is equals to the average, so one over t, the integral from zero to t of C of the C s c dot s, right? So so as you observe, the support you can say that the support of mu t is exactly a subset of uh, C s c dot s. for um, uh, t less than equals to s less than equal to zero. Okay, there's there's nothing surprising here. We are just just putting the mass, you know, there, right? Um, and remember that we have, uh, again, by the, by the regularity, by the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, c dot is bounded. This is really important. I mean, without, without the whole, background that we have done for the first 10 lectures, we wouldn't be able to conclude that. So C dot is bounded, velocity is bounded, hence the support of our measure is bounded always in, 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 um, in this set. So you have support of mu t is always bounded in Tn cross B zero C. And this is clear, right? Because from the above to the below, uh, C dot is bounded by C, so that's clear, okay? And you have, because we take the averaging, we have mu t is a prob probability measure, so uh, it's uh, it's total mass is one, right? The mu t is one. Okay. Uh, and you see that here, that's one of the key points in, um, in relaxation. If you are dealing with the curves itself, uh, we don't have compactness to pass the limit. Uh, so the key idea here, this has occurred a lot in the in the second half of the 20th century, that relaxation is good. I mean, this is essentially the step called relaxation. It's good here, you know, here or also in uh, optimal transport and other fields. That I can't deal with the behavior of the curves directly because I don't have enough compactness. I'll give you an example. Um, but if I were to deal with uh, a relaxation version of that, instead of dealing with the curves, I relax it to measures. Then in the, in the wicker form, in the space of measures, I have compactness, I can pass the limit. So that's, that's the key point. Again, it's very simple, but it's the key point. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, uh, I would say that we don't have, we don't have compactness for curves. I mean, because you can question me, what do I mean here? I'm just saying, you know, curves going to minus infinity, but we have compactness for measures. Okay, of course our measures here have compact support and everything. Uh, if they don't have compact support, I might lose the weight going to infinity, right? But they have compact support and and I can use exactly that, you know, what I'm highlighting here on the left panel, that I can pass the limit 
I can find a subsequence going to minus infinity so that our measures converge quickly in the sense of measures to some measures, right? And mu here C essentially all time. So it's sort of like an averaging behavior for the whole curves when T goes to infinity. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the point. Uh, okay, so let me write down and then I'll give you an example. Um, so you see that um, by doing so, we are nearly done. We have been able to define our measures. We have been able to pass the limit. And moreover, I have this uh, equality. I put a box, a red box here on the left uh, because I take the average, right? So, you know, for our measures, what is written here on the right panel, uh, on, on the right uh, of the equality that, um, uh, you know, L of D mu plus the constant C naught just equals to what's here on the left. It's the average one over T of, of the difference in value, right? But but you see that this one goes to zero, right? This, this thing, uh, um, okay. So U minus X minus U minus of CT over T it's just constant over t, right? And this one goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So therefore, in the limit, we conclude that um, in the limit, the integral on L of xv, the mu of xv equals to c minus c naught. Okay, so, you know, that's why we are taking the averaging limits that we can ignore the uh, you know the 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 errors in 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 terms of the 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 values of the u when we take the average it goes to zero, and that sort of like again uh, you can think of it as an ergodic limit or a large time average that those errors go to zero anyway. So what's left is that is the action of L acting on the measures is equals to uh, to minus c naught. So that's beautiful. Um, and we are nearly done. Uh, uh, now, you know, we have, we have been uh, able to construct a measure mu so that I have this equality, right? So what is left is only, we only need to show that mu is invariant under the Euler-Lagrange law, right? So that's the last step. Um, you know, this is actually not too hard to show. Um, what we need to show is that if we shift the time, right? You know, if we shift the time to uh, maybe different colors, better. If we shift the time to uh, T, then things are okay. Okay, still not a good Let me choose a different one. Um, So if you shift the time to T, uh, then it should be okay. Uh, why? Okay. I mean, roughly speaking, you can think about it this way. You're taking the last time average for a really, really long time. Like, uh, so if you shift the time a little bit, it doesn't matter because it's still that you're taking the average for long enough time, right? So, I mean, and one way to think about that is, is this picture, right? So if you take the average is from, tk to zero and take one over tk integral from tk to zero, right? So that's that's the average. And if you shift the time a little bit, uh, if you shift it instead, you know, instead of from tk to zero, you shift it to tk plus a little t to t, right? So if you compare this one with tk plus t, t, one over still the length is tk, right? If you compare the values, then what do you see? You see that in most of the times, the whole interval still overlap, right? I mean, this whole thing is still in common, right? There's only the two differences that, you know, you have the tiny difference here and a tiny difference there. Each of the differences, the length of 
the length of each of the difference of the integrals of the length t, right? But the length t is a fixed time. It it doesn't matter in a in a in a long run, right? Because I'm dividing by one over t k. Let k goes to infinity, so that thing goes away anyway. So that's that's essentially the idea. So you can see that if we write down in 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 you know rigorously, that's exactly what I wrote down here. So we have it's equals to the limit of this one. So this one is actually x. Uh, I'm sorry about the color. Maybe I'm not gonna choose to write by by this color next time. <laughs> okay. So that's the mentor, right? And then I have I have the two other terms that are negligible, right? It's just the integral of of the 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 length t, right? So uh, I mean to make it precise, each of this is bounded by c times t, right? So you have the error error terms uh, of the of the form c times t because the integral of the interval is t over t k. And this one goes to zero as tk goes to infinity. Okay, and that's essentially the point of a large time average. Large time average means that if you shift things a little bit, those error terms you introduce surely are there, but they don't play a role as you average it out uh, in infinite amount of time. Okay, and that's why it gives you us the invariance property. Now let me give you just this this classical example in 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 dynamics that people often like to give. So this example. Uh, let's say that you have your curve is just that uh, eta. So you start with eta uh, prime of t just equals to a fixed vector v, which is uh, in R n, which is irrational. Okay, and you start with eta zero equals to x. No big deal, right? And you have eta t is going to be equals to x plus t v, say for all t less than equal to zero. And clearly, if you take um, if you take a point x here and you run you run your flow, you know, with irrational vectors, uh, uh, so if you run the flow with irrational vectors, you know that the, the orbit's gonna be dense in, 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 the, in the whole torus, right? So one thing for sure, it's clear that at a t for t less than equal to zero is dense in, in the torus. But moreover, I forgot what's the name of this result that you can also define, you can define uh, mu t as above then you know, um, uh, and, and remember that the velocity is is, is constant here. So uh, so in the velocity space, it's always v. Okay, so v is constant. Okay, uh, so you can see that um, uh, support of mu t is always surely in the torus cross with v, right? You know, I the the in the in the velocity space is also it's always v and if you pass the limit mu t gonna converge weakly to mu in weakly in the sense of measure as a t goes to minus infinity and clearly here that you can see what is mu mu is nothing but uh, the Lebesgue measure on the torus, right? Because it's going to be dense and it's going to be equally distributed. Uh, so what's what's how to say, how to write? It's going to be uh, the Lebesgue measure. Uh, so dx uh, so d mu is going to be dx cos uh, cross with uh, uh, d Delta V, right? Oh no, not D delta. Uh, you know, cross with delta V in the in the in the in the velocity space. Okay, so it you see that although that we start with 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 a um, 
with a very simple thing that in for each of the multi the the measure is just going to be supported in in the in the parts of eta eta dot but as it goes to infinity it's going to be equally distributed everywhere right so um this is a very classical result uh, in in dynamical system of course uh and and clearly that here if you have v is irrational then you don't know what's the mixing rate how fast does it converge to to the um, uh, Lebesgue measures but in general if you have more if v is you know irrational and satisfy certain diaphantine condition and stuff like that and the mixing and whatever is going to be faster but um Anyway, it, it just it's just a simple example to tell you that in the limit the measures can be uh, rather complicated. Uh, but uh, that's all I, what I have to say for today. Actually, we did a lot for today, and then I got really three good questions, uh, important question for today. Um, any other questions or concerns? Um. I, I was just wondering, could you explain a bit more about relaxation and uh, what you mean by the failure of compactness and when you have curves? Yeah. So, for example, you know, if you look into this example, right, like um, I have this completely complicated curves. And um, of course, I know that. Uh, OK, so what we know is that. So surely in this example, we know. That at the t over t as t goes to infinity, uh, minus infinity or whatever, it's just v, right? It's it's just a fixed direction. So we know that um, um, you know uh, the averaging limit we know. But if people ask you about or ask me about like, do I know about the behavior of at t, or can I describe its behavior? Then essentially. I can say that it doesn't converge to anything, right? Just sort of messing around there. I'm kind of not being able to keep track with, with its position. It can be near anything, right? You know, or you can say that any point is a recurrent point. It's getting as close to any point as it wants. So, um, so that's one of the things that if I want to talk about like, um, you know, any kind of compactness result saying that does it converge to anything, you know, if I take subsequences and stuff like that, then it's not stable. I mean, I'm sort of like losing compactness vaguely in that sense, because, you know, um, but but if we relax it to the measures, then people say that with the measures, you can capture all possible subsequential limits. And each of such subsequential limits gives us some good information about, about the, um, the the dynamics you know because that this is exactly also like point carry maps right you know if if i look at this orbits if i want to record like you know the behavior of at the one at the two at the k as k goes to plus minus infinity you know just being um integers right because the point carry map is exactly that you know you look you wait for one year you see what's the earth orbit on this plan and you keep watching it and it's clear that if I just look at eta here uh, as just just values, then it's going to be dense, right? In fact, it's also going to be equally distributed, you know, uh, on on the torus. So, hence, keeping track with measures uh, seemingly a good way to to have compactness and also to be able to understand a bit about the ergodic properties of of the curves. Um, so that's one way to see it. Um, also, that there are um, there are other problems that you know many times if we try to be rigid, we try to just understand um, the actual map, then it's hard. Uh, so there are many many instances that people try to extend your map. You know, instead of thinking of your map just as curves or something uh, or functions, they're gonna think about it's gonna be like maps from measures to measures, something like that. So those are weaker, but in terms, it gives you more compactness. Uh, so that's that's always like um, 
it is the same like if you want to look into the compactness of L1, it's not possible, right? Uh, but if you think about L1 as measures, then you suddenly have compactness in the space of measures. So that's an analog of that. And this is, you know, although it's very simple, but it's a key idea in a lot of areas in the last 50 years or so. Uh, that's amazing. And also let me conclude finally is that also that now we have a new, a new, uh, a new minimization problem, minimization problem in a calculus of variation. Uh, so instead of looking at, at minimizing along the curves, right? Again, if I have fixed length of the curves, then that's fine. But to deal with infinite lengths of the curves, then it's typically problematic with compactness. So the minimization problem becomes very interesting, right? You know, it's also minimizing the Lagrange, the Lagrangians, but not along the curves, but along measures. So mu is... The, measures, probability measures, and mu is invariant under the Euler-Lagrange flow. So this minimizing problem gives me that it's exactly minus C naught. So this is a beautiful minimizing problem, right? It's a relaxation. You see, we are not minimizing among the space of curves anymore, but we are minimizing among the space of measures. So that's why, that's, that's why this result met again. It's, it's a big deal, uh, you know, John Mather did it and you know, it's, it's really important, uh, uh, you know. Um, uh, people realized that it was uh, by the end of 1980s, around 1990s that people realized that, okay. Um, I mean, it's standard now, right? We can do it, but, but by that time it was Amazing, right? You know, people came up with that kind of relaxation idea and, you know, introduce a new kind of minimizing problems for the action functionals among, among the space of measures. Okay. Great. So thanks a lot for the questions. And uh, yeah, I, 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 again, always love to discuss those with you. And it gets to the point that many of the questions I might not be able to answer <laughs> because you see, you know, it, 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 it's getting rather deep now. Um, so again, uh, forgive me if I, if I couldn't answer the questions and, and keep asking um, other than that. And I think we are good for today. I'll see you on Friday. Okay, I'll, I'll try to uh, add the thing I mentioned, um, uh, um, you know, like, uh, um, after teaching my second class right now. Okay. So thank you all and see you on Friday. Bye for now.